and where did it come from? The request, in verse 8, whom shall I send? God sends and invites the volunteers, etc. So, you have there the Sennacherib's own account of his siege of Jerusalem in the inscribed on this stone prism. So there, you have um, some evidence about the book of Isaiah and some of the context of Isaiah in Sennacherib's uh, stone uh, writing there. So now we go to Isaiah chapter 2. So so what we're, what we're learning here, for a Muslim apologist to get the Bible and get the book of Isaiah and say in Isaiah 42, Oh, Isaiah 42, verse 1 to 11. Look, read it. It's all about Muhammad. Okay, well, what's what, what's the book of Isaiah about then? Tell me the themes about the book of Isaiah. Do you, do you grasp the book of Isaiah? How, you know, in other words, there's so much in the book of Isaiah. We just looked at the first half of the book, the depth and the riches of that book. So, in other words, when a Muslim tries to get you in advice and quotes a Bible passage, like a passage out of Isaiah, you either need to have read the book yourself and find the riches of the book, or you need to ask them, what's your understanding of the whole book? What's your understanding of the chapters around this chapter? Because nine times out of ten, they won't know. And it's not right, because without that rich background of understanding the book, you can't even understand Isaiah 42. So, the, in Isaiah, the second half of Isaiah, the servant of the Lord, four passages from Isaiah have been called the servant songs, Isaiah 42, 1-4, to Isaiah 49, 1-6, Isaiah 50, verse 4-9, Isaiah 52, verse 12, to uh, right up to Isaiah 53, verse 12. However, the word servant and the idea of servant of the Lord appear right through Isaiah 41, 8 to 53. And in fact, the word servant occurs fairly regularly throughout Isaiah. God's servant is presented in three ways. All the descendants of Abraham, the just, the faithful descendants of Abraham, an unnamed individual identified in the New Testament as Jesus. Notice especially Isaiah 49, 1 to 6, 52, 13 to 53, 12. Both of these songs picture a servant who is not Israel but an individual humility of God Isaiah chapter 63 to 65 are a remarkable witness of God's humility in chapter 63 Isaiah looks back historically to see what God did for his people in the past in chapter 64 Isaiah appeals to God to show what he still has the same power he even appears to question God's justice in chapter 65 1 to 5 is God's answer he showed himself to people who did not ask for him he was found by people who were not looking for him and then we have the whole list of chapters Isaiah 40 12 to 31 God and the absurdity of idolatry Isaiah 41 1 to 24 God the helper of Israel Isaiah 41 25 29 God Lord of future events Isaiah 42 1 to 9 the servant of the Lord Isaiah 42, 10 to 17, a song of praise to God. Isaiah 42, 18, 25, the blind and the deaf servant. Uh, Isaiah 43, 1 to 13, God the Redeemer of Israel. Isaiah 43, 14, 28, the thank, thankless servant. Isaiah 44, 1 to 5, God, Lord and giver of life. Isaiah 44, 6 to 23, God and the absurdity of idolatry. Isaiah 44, 24, 45, the unwitting servant Cyrus. Isaiah 45, 8 to 13, God the Master Potter. Isaiah 45, 14, 20, the, God the Supreme Lord. Isaiah 46, 1, 13, God and the absurdity of idolatry. Uh, Isaiah 47, 1 to 15, a lament of Babylon. Isaiah 48, 1 to 22, stubborn Israel, patient God. Isaiah 49, 1 to 6, the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 49, 7, 26, salvation, Israel restored. Isaiah 51, 3, 1 to 3, Israel separated but never divorced. Isaiah 54 to 11, the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 51, 1 to 16, salvation and righteousness. Isaiah 51, 17, 23, salvation and wrath. Isaiah 52, 1 to 12, salvation and redemption. Isaiah 52, 13 to 50, Isaiah 53, 12, the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 54, 1 to 17, salvation. Isaiah 55, 1 to 13, salvation and invitation to the thirsty. 
Isaiah 56, 1 to 8, why leave out the foreigner? Isaiah 56, 9 to 57, to the Isaiah 56, verse 9, to Isaiah 57, 13, why not exclude Israel? Isaiah 57, 14 to 21, a call for repentance. Isaiah 58, 1 to 14, a call for genuine fasting. Isaiah 59, 1 to 21, sin, salvation of the spirit. Isaiah chapter 60, 1 to 22, a vision of the new Jerusalem. Isaiah 61, 1 to 11, a vision of Jubilee. Isaiah 42, 1 to 12, a vision of the Saviour. Isaiah 53, 1 to 6, salvation and judgment. And then finally, the humility of God. Isaiah 63, 7 to 10, reminiscence of what God was. Isaiah 63, 11 to 64, 12, remonstrance, where is he now? And 65 to 1 to 16, response, I've always been here. Isaiah 65, 17 to 66, 24, a new heaven and a new earth. And then you have the message. Comfort is offered to God's people, Isaiah 40, verse 1 to 2. To herald speak, they prepare the way, Isaiah 43 to 6. Faith is faith in one unique God, God people and God's service. But it's not, to be, not enough to be comforted. God's people must decide for the one God or the idols, Isaiah 44 one chap chapter one ver to twenty three Israel the chosen he must become Israel the upright Isaiah forty four one to five Israel's God King Redeemer Lord Almighty first last unique rock Isaiah forty four six to ten uh, application the character of God Isaiah is a missionary book God has chosen the people to be the witness but the witness to God must come from those who are rightly related to him living the kind of lives that God demands righteousness is the word often used by Isaiah to describe what God commands demands of his witness Self, uh, ser, uh, themes servant of the Lord work through the entire passage Isaiah 40 to chapter 40 to chapter 66 and note every reference to my servant now divide these references in three groups those which refer to Jacob or Israel, those which refer to just a faithful part of Jacob or Israel, and those which obviously reference to an individual. The meaning of the servant teaching of Isaiah has been illustrated by means of a triangle, with all Israel at the bottom, the faithful remnant in the middle, and the Messiah at the peak. And then there's the uniqueness of God in Isaiah 40-49, to creator of the universe, life giver to man. There is the foolishness of idolatry in Isaiah 40, verse 8 to 19, Isaiah 44, 9 to 20, Isaiah 46, verse 1 to 7. And then there is the sovereignty of God, Isaiah 44, 28, Isaiah 45, verse 1. So, you've got all that information in your head about Isaiah. Muslim comes and says, hello, let's uh, look at Isaiah uh, 42. Okay, let's go. Right? Isaiah 42. A Muslim says, read Isaiah 42. And go to... Verse 11. Let the desert and its town raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar live rejoice. Now, who is Kedar? And you go. I don't know. And they'll go, go to Genesis. And Genesis will show you that it's clear that it is the Arabs. And you're like, whoa. You don't know what to say. Now they've got you in a vice. They've got you in the Islamic vice. You are now at the mercy of their interpretation. Where's this coming from? We've already seen. It's coming there from, the, from a hadith. Where Bukhari quotes it. So that's why they're using that verse. And you're letting them use that verse, and you're and you because you don't know the background, your head's all over the place. But now you've been on a one on one training session on the book of Isaiah. So now you could say to them, wait a minute. First of all, you're interpreting this from your Quran and your hadiths. You you believe the Quran is the word of God and you're 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 interpreting this from that perspective. So you're trying to get me to look at the Quran. Uh, look at the Bible because you believe from your Quran anyway that Muhammad's the true prophet. So that's why you're looking at this. But I say to you that your Quran is not true. It is not the word of God and it is a wrong way to look at the Bible. And secondly, and, and so there are contradictions. There's the contradiction of 
uh, is is the creation six days or eight days? Your contradiction says uh, read the Quran, uh, read the Bible, and yet you're saying the Bible is corrupt, and yet you're using the Bible. So you you you're all over the place. There's contradictions everywhere. You're even using hadith. Your hadith said quote the this passage. That's why you're reading this passage. I don't agree with the hadith. I don't agree with the Quran. They're not of God. You know, it's not a way to look at it. So you throw it back at them. You get their hands off the passage. They're not the ones to control the interpretation of that passage. And then you say, well, well, well wait a minute. Let's let's read the, let, let, let's let's read it in context. Let's go to verse one. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Wait a minute. The word servant, how is it used in the book of Isaiah? Ask them there. It's used in three ways. It's used in the context of Israel is the servant. It's used in the context of the people from Abraham. And then it's used in the context of an individual servant. And it's used a number of times. And when we go to the word servant, there are certain things connected to the word servant. Not only in Isaiah, but in the surrounding prophets. That he is to be the son, uh, uh, to, to, to be uh, come from the line of David. That it is to be the Messiah. That it is to be God. Etc. So, you've now looked at the context of Isaiah. Talked about the word servant within Isaiah. And you've now began to unravel the Islamic vice and turn it on its head. Then when you start to go to wider prophets like Jeremiah and others and bring in what the servant is all about. You've unraveled it even more. And then when you start to say, well, let's have a look at what Jesus says about this passage. You've kind of demolished it. You've got them off the vice, right? You've got the vice off you. Now... Here's the point. When a Muslim quotes a passage from a book like Isaiah, you've just seen from what I've just read you the depth and the riches of just one book. So how dare you and how dare any Muslim, how dare any Muslim come to a Bible passage and think that they can interpret it from the Quran? When the the book of Isaiah, for example, is so rich and de deep in its theology, and how dare you let them do that? You shouldn't let them dictate the interpretation. You should say, wait a minute. You're quoting from Isaiah. Do you realize the richness of this book? Do you realize the depth of this book? Let's do a word study on the word servant in the book of Isaiah. Let's follow it through. In fact, I've got the verses here for you. You never ever let them dictate to you. Because they don't know the Bible. And you should know your Bible. And be able to expound it to them. Looking at the context. Uh, and understanding it. From the context. Okay. So I hope that's been a lesson to you. And that goes when they quote Ezekiel. They'll quote Genesis. Another one they'll quote uh, Deuteronomy. And say that that backs up their argument. Concerning... Um, Concerning Jesus, uh, Muhammad's a prophet in Deuteronomy. Uh, passages when they say there's violence in the Old Testament and they'll quote passages. You've got to get them off their Islamic interpretation and get into the riches of the word. And let the word of God expound, expound it from the word of God. And destroy their authority. If you notice, the Muslims will, when they debate you, they try to destroy straight away your authority. The Bible. Before you even begin, they'll hit you with something about the Bible. Whatever topic it is, they'll attack the Bible. Well, you need to uh, destroy their authority before you even begin. So that they don't have a right to interpret the Bible according to the Quran. But you can interpret the Bible according to the Bible. I hope that's been a lesson to you. I know it's been a long, drawn-out situation. But if, if, if this has drummed into you, you know, how many people have I seen over the years at Hyde Park when you look at the videos and Christians are just battered all over the place because you let, you let them get you into the Islamic vice. 
The Islamic vice, my friend. You let them get you into the Islamic vice. They have the Quran as their hermeneutic. They quote the Bible and you're, you're battered. Your head smashed in because you're following what the Quran's saying now. You're listening to the Muslims' interpretation. You say, no, the Quran's corrupt. Let's see what the Bible has to say as a whole. And you get out of the Islamic vice. All right, I hope that's been a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We give you the prayers, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. And I just commit this day to you, Lord, and I commit these words to you, and I just pray that it would be a help to people in your name, for your glory. Amen. Amen.